You're watching member-supported WNED-TV, Channel 17, Buffalo, serving Western New York and Southern Ontario. We're going to take a little trip back in time, when downtown Buffalo was the destination for great entertainment, fine dining, and wonderful shopping. How about an afternoon taking in a Buffalo Bison baseball game in Offerman Stadium, the manicured ballpark for Buffalo's Boys of Summer, only a stone's throw from the Main Street trolley. Remember anticipating the fun trip across Lake Erie on the Canadiana for a day of swimming and sunning along the sandy stretch of Crystal Beach, riding the Comet roller coaster and other hair-raising contraptions, strolling through the concession stands, tasting those goodies with a distinct Crystal Beach flavor. Before returning home on the 1115 boat ride, there was always a dime a dance at the beautiful Crystal Beach Ballroom to the sounds of the great band leaders of the era. Our nostalgic journey down memory lane remembers the Town Casino, the Delwood Ballroom, Little Harlem, and many more places that are gone, but definitely not forgotten. Things that aren't there anymore. The good old summertime holds fond memories for so many of us living on both sides of the Canadian-American border. Most notably, a day at the beach. Not any old beach, but Crystal Beach, Ontario, a dozen or so miles from Buffalo. It was a fun-filled playground for young and old alike. They came by the thousands to enjoy the sand, the water, the rides, the games, dancing to the big bands, and oh yes, the food. And best of all, there was no admission fee to the park. There was something for everyone. Don Ketterman should know. His family has owned a cottage at Crystal Beach for the past six generations. I think my earliest recollection of the park was when I was very young. I had an aunt that used to stay with us on occasion, and to get me out of the house, uh, she used to take me down to Crystal Beach Park. I would go for two tickets. I would go in the fun house, and I would spend many, many hours in the fun house. And my recollections of that are, are great. The, the, the huge barrel that they had, the old sugar bowl in there, and the, the slides. And about every half an hour, I had to look out the window and say, here I am, I'm fine. And when it was time to go home, she'd say, well, you know, you spent the day here, let's go home. Well, I remember particularly that you did not have to have general admission, that you could just walk through and you would buy tickets for all of the rides. Uh, there were two rides that were my favorites, and that were the Caterpillar and the Heyday. Um, and then as our children were growing up and we would bring them to the park, those became their favorites as well, which had always tickled me. They wanted someone to make Loganberry syrup for Kronfeldt's Loganberry, which is uh, very famous over in this area. I applied for the job to Ken Kronfeldt. He said, well, he said, you look like you can handle it. You're a big person. You have to handle bags of sugar and glucose and mix all this water and stuff. Showed me how to do it and I worked for Ken Kronfeld for seven years in the summer. I made all of the Loganberry, the lemon lime, the orange service, uh, syrup that he sold. Uh, when the park closed for the season, we used to go down there and we would go underneath the, the cyclone roller coaster and we would find all kinds of treasures. We'd find wallets, combs, uh, pen and pencil sets, cigarette cases, money, all kinds of things. Back in the 40s, uh, we, we used to come here, we were just kids, uh, and spend the summers and my parents got so hooked on Crystal Beach, my dad quit his factory job in Welland, uh, moved here, and uh, opened a tourist home, and they had several tourist homes. My first job uh, was in, in the park. That was actually my first job in married life. I was uh, assistant candy maker. I got to uh, make the kisses and the suckers, and uh, Oh, roast the peanuts, make the popcorn. It was at Crystal Beach where I first learned to put vinegar on french fries. And there was also candies there and the lollipops. 
were probably the best of them all, the cinnamon especially. The amusement park was our life as a family. My father worked there as the head painter and deco decorator, uh, mixing all the special colors that went into making the uh, amusement park, park attractive and unique. Uh, my mother eventually sold tickets, my sister sold tickets, and my brother had uh, three jobs, uh, beachcomber, dock boy, and dance hall worker. At four, I actually could, could uh, do the dog paddle and stay afloat. And that was just because of that wonderful, long, shallow beach that was there that kids could walk out a half a mile and only be up to their ways. The next remembrances were of all of the midway and the rides that uh, developed as the years went on. The earliest ones were the merry-go-round and the miniature railway and the caterpillar, heyday, tumble bug. One night we would go to the fun house and spend the whole night in there and come down the slides and go around that beautiful wooden wheel and all the things that were there. And then the next night we'd go roller skating, which imagine 10 cents you could roller skate all night, um, which got to be a lot more expensive later on. And then at 10 o'clock, We'd wander over to the dance hall and sit up in the balcony and watch them dance and listen to the music. And then, because we'd have to be home by 11 o'clock. My mom and dad used to take me and later my own brother over to Crystal Beach. Um, we'd drive over, which was probably the longer way to go. But the more enjoyable part was to take the Canadiana. It was known as the SS Canadiana, the turn-of-the-century cruise ship that plied the waters of Lake Erie into the 1950s. We knew her simply as the Crystal Beach Boat. Because after climbing aboard at the foot of Commercial Street in downtown Buffalo, it was only an hour's ride across the lake to our destination of anticipated fun and excitement. Crystal Beach. That white swan, I used to call her the Canadiana coming up at 9.30. The sun would be setting. And she was all covered with white lights coming up the lake. And I can still see that wonderful ship. And it was just heaven to see her come in. It was just magic, you know, and the engine and the, the waves bursting on you. Just a tremendous feel. You could feel the power in the boat and the, and, and the surging. And I just loved it, you know, and, and the dancing and, uh, you know, romancing back and forth. and. Uh, uh, the big bands and, and all the fun that it provided and the moonlight cruises and all of that stuff. During its heyday, the Canadiana had the largest dance floor of any passenger steamer on the Great Lakes. The happy and romantic memories of those days dancing to the big bands under a starlit night on a smooth sea won a special place in the hearts of millions of passengers for over a half century. In my time, it was essentially Harold Austin who people know from the Delwood Ballroom in Buffalo as well as, as being on the boat. And he would always play the full uh, time in the Crystal Beach Ballroom once he got there. So they'd come, they'd leave Buffalo at 8 and play on the boat till 9.30 and then come to the ballroom, play till 11, and then at 11.30 they'd, they'd leave on the boat and play till 12.30 back to Buffalo. Harold Arland, who was quite famous for writing many famous songs. He had his little orchestra there. I think he came from Tonawanda rather than Buffalo, but he was a local boy. The Canadiana uh, was a three-decked boat, and the second deck was where the music was, so you had to walk up the stairs. And the bandstand was in the, I'd say in the middle of the second deck, elevated somewhat, um, two or three feet off the ground. Um, interesting to play an instrument where you're standing up like a bass fiddle on a wavy night. <laughs> that was also fun. Keeping your balance was part of the trick. We had, uh, well, maybe about a 14-piece band, and we just, everybody had a squeeze in there. And we had two vocalists. We had a girl vocalist and myself. We couldn't sit on the bandstand. When you got ready to sing, you had to kind of climb up over a railing and kind of hang on to that center beam that went across so you wouldn't fall off. I remember one particular time, out of a clear blue sky, literally a clear blue sky, a storm kicked up. And uh, we were rocking and rolling real good for about two hours. But it wasn't planned. It was always crowded. It was always crowded and the crowded with dancers. Uh, the 815 ride going over uh, was always full and you could play mostly kid music, mostly jitterbug stuff, because these are the kids who were there. The older people didn't didn't make that trip. Jeeping was, was pre-jitterbug. And jeeping was a kind of a rhythmic hopping. So there was a big, big letters, no jeeping. In fact, even jitterbugging, you had to be careful 
You couldn't get this crowd into a frenzy because it did rock the boat. We'd take the 815 going across, we'd play maybe uh, three, four sets, and then we'd get off over in Canada, and we'd uh, play the large mammoth ballroom they had over there. The fabulous Crystal Beach Ballroom, built in 1925 for a quarter million dollars, was noted for its cantilevered construction, void of any posts, and its spacious but highly polished hardwood dance floor. It's not there anymore, but before it closed its doors in the mid-1950s, thousands of teens and adults alike were thrilled by the great sounds of the big bands. And the thrill it was for a teenage bass fiddle player from Buffalo named Tommy Rizzo. A beautiful room. Again, large, elevated stage that had to be maybe uh, six feet high so that only the tops, heads of the, tops of the heads of the dancers was uh, seen. Uh, the sparkling ball with the lights playing on it so that it, it sparkled. Um, tables around the perimeter so that you could have your drink and sit there and watch. That was a massive thing, massive, a beautiful, just a beautiful ballroom. And, they, and the sides would open up and they'd have a, the breezes would go through. There was just a beautiful setup. Carol Austin first hired me to uh, work in his band and then uh, when I came back from the service, uh, he turned the band over to me. And uh, that was fun to do also because I got a chance to do it my way. There was a Canadian requirement that if you brought an American band into Canada, you had to have a band of the same size that was Canadian. So they bought a, a, a good band, it was a good band, from Toronto, Bert Maiosi, and he had basically the same size band that we did. And uh, it became more like a fraternal organization. We got along very well with them, and they got along very well with us. And of course, the infamous out both sides, the fellows with the ropes. Being a dime a dance, you paid a ticket, you got on the dance floor, you danced, and as the music ended, the fellows would walk from the end with ropes and just kind of shepherd you out the sides and the new group would come in. Usually the main band was a Canadian band. There was Bert Niozzi, I remember, from Toronto. Uh, there was Art Hallman and then there was the now famous Maynard Ferguson. Maynard started out as a trumpet player in Bert Niozzi's band. That was his first introduction and then as the years went on, and not too many years, he became the leader. Maynard had the band, the large band, and we had the relief band when they were resting. Boy, they didn't want me to play no long tunes, you know, because it was a dime a dance. And uh, then they would rope the people off the dance floor, you know. And uh, uh, as young as I was, I hadn't ever seen that before. And uh, to tell you the truth, I've never seen it since. <laughs> everybody was alive and kicking then. I'm talking about everybody from Stan Kenton to uh, Woody Herman to the Dorseys to Benny Goodman to... Uh, uh, Gene Krupa, and uh, we were the opening act uh, for, for all of those bands. One very special remembrance was uh, working in a drugstore opposite the, uh, one of the entrances to the park. Every day uh, was a very special day for a Maynard Ferguson who got his start at Crystal Beach. He was 18 years old at the time and had to stop in the store daily to get medication to heal his lips that were swollen from playing every night at the ballroom. Freelance photographer Paul Cassie of Crystal Beach met up with the great Lionel Hampton a few years back for a farewell performance in the grand old ballroom. I stayed and taped the uh, performance and it, it was great to see the people dancing, real dancing. I started with Harold Austin about 1933 at a place called the Delwood Lodge. And when he had, of course, Harold at one time had probably the finest band in the city. We were at the Delwood Ballroom on the corner of Maine and Utica. For, he was there for years. I, I joined him. I was there for about five years with him. But at one time, I think everybody in the city of Buffalo came to the Delwood. And there again, the admission was, I think, was 25 cents. And the place had hold about uh, 1,500, 2,000. 
beautiful place, beautiful place, a great place, good musicians, uh, people who wanted to dance. Um, doesn't exist anymore. Places like that don't exist anymore. No liquor, strictly soft drinks, hot dogs, etc. And the one thing I remembered, the, as you walked up this long flight of stairs, there it must have been 20, 30 stairs to get up there. At the top of the stairs were two rather large bouncers. <clears throat> if you were under the influence, you didn't get in. If you were a roughneck, you didn't get in. If you weren't dressed properly, you didn't get in. And that's how Harold maintained a respectable place that people were not afraid to go to, to dance. The people who got in there went there to dance, and that's what they did. And from there, we used to broadcast uh, six, seven nights a week. We were on uh, WEBR for a while, and then we were on uh, Buffalo Broadcasting for a while. We'd play from 9 to 12, they'd empty out the ballroom, and because people were in the war plants, then we used to run a session from 1 to 4 in the morning for the swing shifters. We'd go home, sleep a little, and then at noon on Saturday, there was a teen dance. Remember Bob Wells used to do that? I was with WEBR at the time when Bob Wells did the high teen show from the Delwood Ballroom, Maine and Utica. Uh, when he'd go on vacation, I'd do the show once in a great while, but it was mainly his broadcast, and he made it the most popular thing. Well, between Cleveland and uh, New York City. We would go to the uh, Delwood Ballroom. It was on the air from 1 till 6 o'clock every Saturday. And it was attended by anywhere between 600 to 1,000 kids. And it was amazing. It was what we really needed back then, what they really need today. And you'd go in and pay your admission and go around. There were always a lot of girls and just ask them to dance and you'd dance. I suppose... Uh, a lot of people made some lasting uh, relationships from that. I didn't happen to be one, but uh, it was a good time. Well, that's how you got to meet your wife, you know, through a girlfriend. Uh, and uh, well, fortunately, I didn't meet mine there. Uh, I met her at another record hop. <clears throat> it was my job to get the recording artist in for interviews. For instance, like Andy Williams and Pat Boone. Music of that era, by the way, and Tony Bennett did a lot of good for the kids. And uh, they would come from all over, South Buffalo, the East Side, West Side. In those years, uh, it was just the opposite. People from Toronto and Hamilton would come down to Buffalo for entertainment because we had the various clubs. One of the things that led to that in those years, uh, for instance, on Saturday night in Toronto, they stopped serving drinks at 11.30. So... Uh, a great many people uh, came to Buffalo uh, or Niagara Falls uh, so that they could uh, party a little bit longer in the evening than that. And uh, also we had, we had uh, a good leg up on the top entertainment. Crystal Beach, the Canadiana, the Delwood Ballroom. Fond memories. Don't go away, because when we come back, you'll find yourself on a nostalgic trip back in time to the shops, restaurants, and night spots in downtown Buffalo. A look at yesterday's Niagara Falls, the long-gone breweries, and the great sporting events in Offerman Stadium and War Memorial. that aren't there anymore. Before bus service took over completely, around 1950, we depended on the neighborhood streetcars to get around. Like this number... ...street trolley, which would shake from side to side as it wound through west side streets and alleys to downtown Buffalo. Main Street was entertainment, dining, and nightlife. And the street was always bustling with activity, daytime or evening. And our neighbors to the north were a great part of that scene. Canadian shoppers could come over not simply on the weekends, but also during the week. It should be remembered at that time that the stores were not open on Sundays and at the most might be open until noon on a Saturday. 
so that the Canadian shopper would be in Buffalo during the week to do shopping, but then in Buffalo on the weekend for the entertainment value. Since Crystal Beach and Buffalo were uh, interwoven both with people and, and the good times enjoyed by both sides of the border, a favorite of many people from this uh, southern Ontario, southern, a favorite time was to take the uh, boat or the bus from Crystal Beach uh, to the downtown area when downtown Buffalo Ailey something. Sheldon Square was there, which people forget about, which is a beautiful... Fortunately, this is one of those tales, but we always would have to stop in the washrooms because we'd been a long time on the way sometimes. But we always would go through uh, Sheldon Square on the way back to Commercial Street to get on the boat. In those days, uh, the retail business in Buffalo was all downtown. You had, uh, well, just to name the stores we were talking about, AM&A, &A, Hanger, Henson Kelly, E.W. Edwards & Company. Uh, you had Richmond Clothes, Bond Clothes, Klein Hands, uh, Jacoby Brothers, Martin Jacoby Men's Stores. You had L.L. Burger. You had Oppenheim & Collins, and the Women's Wear Stores, both fine stores. Downtown Buffalo was, was always very exciting for me as a kid, whether uh, I took the bus alone after I was old enough. Uh, actually, I remember working at Meisner's as a young girl. Uh, I worked in the unmentionable department. The shopping was always fun, especially at holiday time, Christmas time, when your mother would bring you down and you'd go see the Santa Claus. And at one store, I believe it was the Hangar store, you could even get an advanced Christmas present your mother, of course, had to pay for it. It was probably 25 cents. But that was incentive enough to go downtown and to see Santa Claus. Oh, I used to love hangers. It was such a classy place. I would go in there. I never had a whole lot of money to spend, but after working at Neisner's, I'd save a little bit and go in there, maybe buy myself a scarf or a little piece of jewelry or cologne then wasn't what it is now. And I always enjoyed going in there. There were trolley cars that went down Main Street along Hurdle Avenue and a number of the other streets. It used to cost three cents to take the bus from where I lived in Kenmore into the city line and another three cents downtown. You know, it was always downtown. Why not uptown? Downtown Buffalo always tempted us to stop in for a bite. Yes, food, and lots of it, from dozens of eating establishments ranging from to great restaurants. And the price Gold's restaurant on Main Street, I think it was Main and Chippewa. And uh, we had Lobby's Old Spain, which was uh, on Main Street, and Lobby's Cafeteria, which was... Lobby's Old Spain is still there, but it's a Swiss LA today. And at that time, to walk in like you were in a little Spanish household. Well, it was December the 8th, 1945, and uh, I got married out in Hamburg, and then we drove downtown to La Bizo, Spain to have dinner. And uh, this, is, this menu I have is a souvenir menu. It says on the envelope. So uh, I kept it all these years. Oh, that deluxe dinner, imagine a whole dinner. Coffee, a dollar thirty-five. The luncheon was sixty-five cents. To four thirty. Then I had a little job in the Ellicott Square building, and when I worked on Saturday, 
at lunchtime, I'd run across the street to Hugh's restaurant, and they had the greatest deli sandwiches. There was about that much deli meat in there, and they had great chili, and the prices were ridiculously low. And the press hung out in there. I'd, I'd run into reporters and see people with their cameras hanging on their shoulders and so forth. And again, all this was exciting. I, I did go to Dan Montgomery's. Uh, I had steak dinner there, a date took me there after a dance. And I remember the women had long dresses on when they would come to take our orders. And they were mostly black and very attractive and very gentle. It was quite an experience for me. 158 Exchange Street, I remember the number. Uh, it was quite a spot and uh, it had beautiful dec decor. decor. Uh, quite prominent all through the place. And uh, antique that uh, you, you, uh, it was almost priceless, you know. I don't think anybody could say anything detrimental about Dan Montgomery's place. It was terrific. Of months, the Clinton administration had uh, fought very hard to keep this administration, sorry, to keep the, uh, the agency from being created once it was signed into law. They kind of sat on it and their supporters